reading to you from 1 Corinthians and the 15th, ver 15th chapter and with the 58th verse. <clears throat> Therefore, my beloved brethren, be ye steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, for as much as you know that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. Good evening, my dear listening friends. Again, this is Evangelist Cecil Moe. And as you know, I'm a converted alcoholic. Gave my heart to Christ over 55 years ago in a pastor's home in Seattle, Washington. And then one year later, God called me to preach. And I've been sharing Christ ever since. You know, <clears throat> have you ever felt led of the Lord do something? and you did it, and you didn't see no results? Well, I've had that happen to me. But that doesn't mean that God doesn't take care of it. He promises us that he'd take care of us. Oh, dear friends, if you're not a tither, I want you to know you're missing such a blessing. <clears throat> no, God doesn't need the money. He owns a cattle on a thousand hills, but this is a test for your heart. Where's your heart tonight? You say, well, see, so now look, I, I love the Lord and I go to church, and but you know, tithe is, listen, tithe is very appropriate for everybody. We all have to give the same 10% as God has prospered you. Not going out and signing a bunch of pledges for a church that doesn't have any faith I don't see where I'm walking I walk by faith listen be with you for a half an hour tonight I just hope you kick off your slippers sit back and relax pour you a cup of coffee let's see what the Lord has for us okay If you have your Bibles with you, turn with me to Acts, the 20th chapter, and let's read that one verse, verse 7. And upon the first day of the week, when the disciples came together to break bread, Paul preached unto them, uh, preached unto them, uh, ready to depart on the morrow, and continued his speech until midnight. Now, here's a, a title that's going to cause some uh, problems tonight. And the title of the message is, Why Worship on Sunday? Now, believe it or not, most Christians worship on Sunday. Well, why has Sunday become the day of worship? What are the Bible's reason for public worship on Sunday? Well, Sunday was the day of the resurrection, and I read in Luke 24, 1. Now, upon the first day of the week... Um, early in the morning, they came unto the sepulchre, bringing the spices which they had prepared, and certain others with them. Well, the resurrection proved the deity of Christ. Now, how do I know that? Because Romans 1, 4 says, And declared to be the Son of God, with power according to the spirit of holiness by their resurrection from the dead. Well, friends, listen. Did you know there would be no church without the resurrection? 1 Corinthians fifteen fourteen says, And if Christ be not risen, 
then our preaching is in vain, and your faith is also in vain. Had he not rose. Now it was prophesied in the Old Testament on that Jesus would be crucified. He would be buried in a tomb. And uh, in the third day, he would arise from the tomb. Well, you see, when the Jews and a lot of those people who put him to death, it wasn't just only Jews, but they put him to death on that cross. They said, we got to shut that man up. He is absolutely dangerous. Well, they did. They crucified him. Oh, the torture, the pain that our wonderful Savior went through for you and for me. Oh, I can't imagine the pain that he suffered. They put those nails and spikes in his hands and his feet, and then they dropped him that big old uh, rugged cross down in that into that deep thing, and it just thud, and of course it would tore his hands. Well, then they took him down off the cross. They took him over to a bar tomb. They put him in it, put him in grave clothes, and then they rolled a huge, I don't know how many ton that stone weighed, I don't know, but they, they covered the front of that tomb, and they said, now it's settled. This turkey's not going to be bothering us anymore. And so they posted some guards there, just to be sure. Well, I got some news for you. That didn't do it. The angel of the Lord moved that big, huge boulder, and when they run into the, Mary and him run into the grave, they found him gone. They found his grave clothes all unwrapped and laid there, but he was gone. Wow! Now we got something to shout about. Had Jesus not arose from that grave, you and I wouldn't have nothing to say. There would be no churches. There'd be nothing. Now the resurrection authenticated the teachings of Christ. In John 2.18, it says, Then answered the Jews and said unto him, what sign showest thou when uh, thou were seeing that thou dost these things? Jesus answered and said unto them, Destroy this temple, and in three days I will rise, raise it up. Then said the Jews, Forty and six years was the temple in building, and with those and you're going to rears up in this in three days? But he spoke of the temple of his body. Listen, the lost Jews misunderstood the truth many, many times. Well, he did just exactly that. He came forth from the grave. Oh, I love Easter Sunday morning. Sing. Up from the grave he arose. Oh, my his answer to these seeking a sign of authority. Resurrection is a fitting day to teach his word. Sunday is a great day to gather to celebrate new life. Friends, listen. <clears throat> Excuse me. Acts 27 which said, And upon the first day of the week, when the disciples came together to break bread, Paul preached unto them, ready to depart on the morrow, and continues his speech until midnight. You know, one thing I liked about Paul, first of all, <clears throat> he always told people how he met Jesus. I have yacked and harped on this since I've been preaching. Give your testimony. That's one of the most 
powerful preaching in the world. You t well, see, if you don't have a testimony, you're not saved. <clears throat> now you say, well, I don't have a testimony like you drunks and drug. I don't care. I don't care. My wife was a do-gooder. Millie was a do-gooder. Everybody was do-gooders. But they were lost. They did not believe that they were sinners. Beloved, we have all sinned and come short of the glory of God. Every one of us. Well, what makes a day of worship? Well, it's a day to pray and preach the gospel. A day to fellowship with believers and celebrate communion. A day to give offerings to the Lord. And at the beginning of the broadcast, I said, you know, friends, if you don't tithe, you're missing such a blessing. You know, when I first started tithing, it was impossible. You know, I just got saved, and I'd been a drunk, and I owed bills, and there was no way I could. I figured if I gave a dollar a week, I was pretty well supporting my pastor and a few missionaries, and that, but that was a joke. When I read what the pastor taught me and, and others that uh, the that tithing was of the Lord, Old Testament, New Testament, then I said, well, I'll try it. And you know what? I'll tell you right now, you can try all you want, but you can't outgive God. No, friends, he doesn't need your money, but he wants to know where you stand with him. Where is your heart tonight? Are you concerned about lost people? Are you concerned about your church? Do you pray for your church and your deacons if you have deacons? Do you pray for things uh, that God wants you to do? Well, that's a good place to do it, in church. The first day of the week was for bringing offerings to the church. 1 Corinthians 16, 2. Upon the first day of the week, <clears throat> let every one of you lay by him in store as God has prospered him, that there be no gatherings when I come in, you know, and I've said this many times, and I'm not saying to you that my halo is too tight. But when I went and I travel all over the half of the world to preaching revivals, and I will tell you, friends, I would not let that pastor of that church get up there and beg for money for me and my ministry. I would not allow it to happen. Oh, you say, well, well, listen, when I pastored a church, when we had a revival, the church and I would discuss, we would give our revengers a minimum uh, offering. I mean, like it was 300 or 200 or whatever it was, but we would, this, this church, total autonomy, would decide on how much to pay the church. Now... At the end of the revival, we would take up a special love offering for that evangelist. But we didn't beg. We didn't get up there and plead. But the people knew that's what we're supposed to do. A workman is worthy of his hire. I never, only one revival I ever got real money in, and that was when I preached in that big church in Dallas. They gave me $800. And a, and a deacon gave me 500 extra. That's the most money I ever got in my entire life while preaching, and I appreciated that. Well, why did early Christians go to the temple on Saturday? Well, on Saturday they evangelized at the temple, and on Sunday, they worshiped in church meetings. On Sunday, we follow their example in public worship. 
Now, Sunday commemorates the deliverance from the law. Galatians 2.16 Knowing that a man is not justified by the works of the law, but by the faith of Jesus Christ, even we have believed in Jesus Christ that we might be justified by the faith of Christ and not the works of the law. For the works of the law shall no flesh shall be justified. Oh, my friends, there's so many people who go to church on Saturday and boy, and there are those who do not eat meat. They think that's a religion. The Bible said about it, spoke about those who d didn't give it to marriage, which the Catholic priests don't do, and then they didn't eat meat. But beloved, trust me, trust the word of God. Nobody is justified by keeping the law, Galatians 3.11. But that no man is justified by the law <clears throat> in the sight of God, it is evident for the just shall live by faith. <clears throat> Excuse me, brother, but I'm going to tell you something, folks. And again, my halo hasn't slipped down over my eyes, but I better tell you that. Many, many times, my wife and family and my kiddies, we'd take off. One time, we were living in Oakland, California, and I had made application to go to a school down in Riverside, California. We had $30 in our pocket. That is all the money we had in this world. No credit cards in those days. And we had a trailer on the back of my old car loaded with all of our life's possessions. And I told my wife, I said, well, we're leaving today for San Francisco, or into, for Riverside. She said, well, honey, we, you got a bad tire in your car, and we don't have a spare. I said, I know that. I'm well aware of that. So I said, tell what we're going to do. We're going to pull in this gas station. I'm going to have a boot put in. And she didn't know what a boot was either, but I asked the guy if he could put a boot in our car, in our tire. And she, he said, a boot? He said, that's a big Chrysler automobile. You can, That thing wouldn't, men are let that down off the jack. It's going to explode. I said, I've got to take that chance because $30 is all the money I have to get to Riverside. I don't know how many miles it was, but I knew this. We went over to a grocery store, and we bought a great big large loaf of Wonder Bread, if I remember correctly. We bought some bologna, and we bought some uh, butter, Cuba butter, I mean a little pad of butter, and we put that butter on that, and we made sandwiches, and we bought some pop for my kids and, and I, and off we went to Riverside, California. All the faith in the world. Now let me tell you what, to show you how God takes care of even simple-minded people like Cecil and Mo. We pulled into Riverside, and <clears throat> we went to a Realtor, and we told him we we're looking for a house to rent. And he said, yeah, I can get you a house. He said, how much you want to pay? I said, oh, I don't know, 75, 70. Well, yeah, I can get you a house for that. Well, and the man, now this, this you blow your socks off. This man reaches in his pocket, pulls out a $10 bill, <clears throat> and said, the Lord laid down my heart to give this to you. <clears throat> I'm going to go in there to to rent a house, but here he gave me $10. We went and bought uh, 
uh, half a dozen eggs. And we bought a little coffee, a little uh, jar of coffee. And we went back and we had a nice meal at our motel. And that $10 helped pay for our motel. After the <clears throat> dinner was over, my wife said, well, Honey, I don't want to break your bubble, but uh, how you plan on paying for a house when you don't have any money? You know, it never even entered my mind. I must be kind of dingy, huh? Anyway, so I put the kids to bed, my wife and I, and I went out and got in the car and rolled the windows up. I said, Lord, we're here in Riverside. Thank you for the safe journey down. Thankful that tar held up. Now, Father, I don't know what to do. I, I'm i supposed to be renting a house tomorrow. I don't have money. Now, let me tell you what happened. The Lord laid it on my heart to call a man who I hadn't seen since I was a little boy in high school. He was a very wealthy man and a friend of our family and a my dad and mom. And I called him. He said, well, Cecil Mo, where in the world are you and what are you up to? I said, well, I'm down here getting ready to go to Bible college, but I don't have any money for rent for a house. How much do you need? I said, $75. He said, where do I wire it? And he wired that money to, to Western Union. I went down and picked it up the next day and rented a house. But, beloved, let me tell you what. Nobody is justified by keeping the law. Galatians 3.11 But that no man is justified by the law in the sight of God, it is evident for the just shall live by faith. Oh, many times, beloved, I, my wife and I and family have traveled with no money, I remember when I was pastoring a church in Anacortes, Washington. We had two services a day, and they gave me a hundred dollars a month if the money came in, and I had to. We'd get done with Sunday morning service, and then we'd have to drive forty miles back home, and then we'd come back that night and I'd preach, and we'd stop and we'd buy couple of weenies for each one of the kids and a little pop and that was our dinner and we'd go home rest up and come back and oh friends yes walking by faith now I can laugh I can smile but at the time I was dead serious oh I was dead serious yes the just should walk by faith but I want you to know we are saved by grace through faith. For by grace are you saved through faith. That not of yourself is a gift of God, not of works, lest any man boast. Now, no amount of law-keeping or others' works can save us. We ought to celebrate from being free from the law. Grace calls for a higher standard than the law. And I read in Romans 7, 6, and now we are delivered from the law, that being dead, wherein we were held, that we should serve in newness of spirit and not in the oldness of the letter. Okay? All right. How's that sound to you? The spirit of the law calls for greater holiness. Now, the law called for Israel to rest on Saturday. But under grace, we rest and worship one day a week. Now, for centuries, most Christians have made Sunday that day of rest and worship. Now, those who walk in the ancient practice attain unto newness of hope, no longer observing Sabbaths, but fashioning their lives after the Lord's day on which our life also rose to him that we may be found disciples of Jesus Christ, our only teacher. Oh, my star. Isn't that beautiful? K. 
Keeping a certain day of worship does not save. No siree, Romans 14, 5. One man esteemeth one day above the, uh, the another, and, and, and the other esteemeth every day alike. Let every man be fully persuaded in his own mind. Growth in grace comes through public and private worship. Oh, listen, we ought to have private worship every day. Sunday is a fitting day for public worship. Colossians 2.16 Let no man therefore judge you in meat or in drink or in repeat on the, of the holy day or the new moon or of the Sabbath days. You know what, friends? i got to tell you this story. I was preaching in my church in, in uh, Oregon. And all of a sudden, this great big old boy, he was a big guy, jumped right up in the middle of the crowd. There's about a hundred and some people in there. He said, Preacher, did I understand you'd say that your church is the only one going to heaven? I said, No, sir. The Bible said, Whosoever will may come. He was a Seventh-day Adventist law keeper. We had a lunch, uh, had a dinner that night after the church for my wedding anniversary and I knew he was going to be there and I told him why I said I don't want to go because I said he's a seven day Adventist and what's the first thing he's going to say what about that day was I right you bet I was he said preacher what about that day I said what about it I said you serve the Lord and go to uh, Saturday I serve the Lord seven days a week what's your excuse then I witnessed to him, and I told him, I said, you know, if I were you, I'd get down on my bony knees and I'd cry out, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. Did you know his wife heard me? I guess I was talking pretty loud. I get pretty excited when I talk about Jesus. And she run in, fully expecting old Jake to have me down the floor, choking me to death. And she said, Jake... If you give your heart to Christ tonight, I will too. And we fell on our knees and all those people in that house. And I led those two precious people to Christ. Not only that, but they brought their daughter to see. They lived about 100 miles from us. They brought their daughter and I led her to Christ, teenage girl. Then I you know, went up to uh, uh, Milton Freewater and led his sister who was dying of cancer to Christ and she died three days later later Jake died not too long ago I talked to his daughter and she said oh brother Mo daddy died so good well I said all Christians die good she said he was so happy he knew he was going to heaven friends listen if you're trying to there's you cannot be justified by the law in fact the matters i want to tell you a story this is true happened to me uh i was working for this guy and he was a seventh day adventist and his wife got i mean his daughter got saved and it really upset him and he was telling me about don't eat meat and don't do this and don't do that and in fact, we'd go to a restaurant to eat lunch, and he'd say, you pray to your God, and I pray to mine. <laughs> when you talk about one Lord, one faith, one baptism, he wouldn't even pray because he didn't think I was a born-again believer. Well, one day we were out working on a job. I was siding, putting siding on us, and I said, oh, free from the law, happy condition. He fired me right on the spot. Beloved, listen to me. i got to hurry. My time's running down on me. Boy, oh boy, when you're having a good time, isn't it hard to shut up? Well, listen, you say, Cecil, I don't know where I'm going to spend eternity. I don't know if I'm even saved. Well, listen, the Bible said you may know. Well, I'll ask you, if you were to die tonight, where would you go? You say, I don't know. I hope I'm going to heaven, but I don't know. Well, the Bible said you can know. Yes, he did. He said, Jesus written that you may know that you pass from death and life. 
If you'd like to trust Jesus and you feel a real tugging at your old heart tonight, will you bow your head with me? And, and, and I want you to pray this sinner's prayer only if you really mean it. Here's how it goes. Dear Lord, I confess that I'm a sinner. Lord Jesus, come into my heart and save me tonight for Jesus' sake. Amen. If you prayed that prayer, I want you to get on the phone. Call 303-471-8534. I won't use your name on the air. I won't embarrass you. I won't sit down and write and ask you for any money. Don't care where you go to church. Oh, friend, I won't be concerned about where you spend eternity. Friend, if you can't afford this call, please call me, collect. I'll accept the charge. My dear friends, uh, your host has been Evangelist Cecil Moe. I want to thank you for listening. To that. And I hope this answered a lot of questions. I know a lot of Christians say, well, I don't know whether we should go to on Sunday or Saturday. Well, the Bible said we're to go on Sunday. Don't worry about it. You're not under the law now. You're under grace if you're saved. Well, pray that this operation will come off real soon. I want to get well and get going here. Please pray for us and pray for our health. And, and also, I want you to uh, pray for a man. His name is Tim, Tim Camel. He's a preacher's friend of son. He fell down and fly to steps, broke both collarbones, and he's really suffering. Please pray for him and his wife. Well, friends, until this time next Sunday night, I want you to be good to your neighbors. Stay sweet. Keep looking up for this wonderful, wonderful Jesus is coming soon. Good night and may God bless you real, real good. <laughs>